Hi, I'm Whirl. I'm Little Doughy. I'm Tommy. Hi. My name is Meryl Morphic. About three months ago now, I made a little video about Moral Oral, just intending to revisit a cute little show that I remembered watching back in the day. And oh, holy sh**, what the hell happened? Yeah, so that original video kinda blew up and sent my channel soaring with it. Before posting the Moral Oral video, I had about 2,000 subscribers, and my largest video otherwise was a freaking time lapse from the video game Destiny that I spent like an hour making. So this was a bit of a shock, but in a good way. See, apparently at the same time I was getting back into the show, so was everybody else on the entire planet. As far as I've been able to gather, the show's resurgence in popularity began on TikTok because, of course, where it really resonated with people. I don't know. Something about the show's satire of hyper-religious, hypocritical groups of people struck a nerve. Can't imagine why that might be. I got a lot of great comments from that video. A lot of supportive people. Some great different perspectives to some of the takes that I shared within. And so many, so... So many people telling me that all the blood in the bath came from Oral's friends, not from innocent babies. If I had a nickel for every time someone left that comment about the damn bathtub, I could throw a lot of fucking nickels at the next person to try it. It makes me kind of want to say wrong shit in my videos on purpose to drive up engagement. You are all susceptible to Cunningham's law. Stephanie is secretly a furry and Tommy is actually Oral's son from the future. Anyways, we're here today because in that original video, I failed to talk about the final episode of Moral Oral, the only one that isn't in the old 4x3 format, the only one over 12 minutes long, and the only one to be released after the 2008 financial crisis. Coincidence? We'll see. Just as a side note, there will be spoilers for the rest of Moral Oral, which should be obvious since the episode itself references those events, but, you know, fair warning. As I discussed in the last video, Moral Oral was intended to continue after Season 3. Dino Stamatopoulos, the show's creator, planned to bring Oral's grandfather into the picture, who was, if not an atheist, at least much more skeptical than the average Moraltonian. This would have coincided with Oral's own crisis of faith that we saw evolving throughout the third season. Oral was even supposed to become some sort of goth kid. I need this. Give me guyliner oral in screamo band tees, you cowards. Unfortunately, as the show was cancelled, those plans never came to fruition. However, they will become important to understand the choices made for before oral. One comment I got in my last video, quite a bit, is that most of its runtime was basically me recapping the show, to which I'd respond, How dare you assume things that are entirely correct? That's what we're gonna do here as well. I'm going to recap the episode, sprinkling in my analysis and critiques throughout, like fucking Parmesan on your spaghetti. So if that's not your cup of tea or bowl of bolognese, I guess, you know, now you know up front this time. Anyways, let's get into it. The only episode of Beforeal Oral, entitled Trust, is set eight years before the events of the main show. Aren't I cuter than eight years from now, probably? It begins exactly how this video began with Oral meeting his newly found friends, Doey, Tommy, and... The episode starts out innocently enough, with little Oral jumping to his near death from an electrical tower placed directly in the middle of the playground. That precocious little scamp. But even as he is writhing in pain, the show communicates to us the boundless nature of Oral's suggestibility. Maybe you should go up there and walk off and not fall again. <gasps> Good idea! Then, just so the audience doesn't forget which show they're watching, we immediately fade into Coach Stop Frame pounding away on Bloberta. This is the moment Shapey was conceived, an event alluded to in the original series. But showing the two bone down isn't quite enough for Mr. Scanapopulous. Oh no. Instead, we follow the sperm down Stop Frame's shaft, out the urethra, and watch them fertilize the egg in real time. The scene mostly just serves to show us something we already knew. Really, before oral as a whole seems to exist to make explicit many of the things that the original series implied. Honestly, these parts aren't my favorites of the episode, as I feel like the original series walked the line between subtle and brash pretty well, and it didn't really need more context. But luckily, that's not all of before oral, so let's not be too quick to judge. Exhibit A. One thing that wasn't alluded to in the original series was the fact that having Shapey was a ploy by Coach Stopframe all along. Gotta go, buddy. No, 
In the middle of giggling? Hmm, I'm late for being too early for something. I don't really get what his endgame was here, but by some twisted logic, he must have thought creating a child with Bloberta would have given him a chance to stay close to the family? Question mark? Not sure. It does seem to give an explanation for something that didn't make sense to me in the original series. Coach Stopframe is pretty clearly coded as gay, not bi. I mean, I guess he could be pan, but point is, it never really made sense why he'd sleep with Bloberta. I don't know, maybe I'm looking too far into it, but the creators really went out of their way to make Stop Frame pretty flamboyant, and back in 2006, doing that basically meant that the character was gay. There wasn't much subtlety there. But now we know that the act was purely mercenary. He didn't even really pretend to care about Bloberta in the moment, let alone later on. We then skip to five weeks later. Bloberta and Clay are arguing about her newfound pregnancy. She deflects from the logistical questions of how she got pregnant by accusing Clay of being neglectful of Oral, and suggests that he use his study when Oral needs lecturing. Oh please, you know very well that two kids are easier to neglect than one. In this conversation, Bloberta implies that even this early into the marriage, Clay has already started to retreat from his life, hiding away from the family in his study. It makes sense, as we learned in the original series, that their marriage is based on lies and desperation, even from the get-go. And while I'm no therapist, I can tell you that's not a good foundation. One thing I never really mentioned in the original video is the quality of the voice acting and how well the lines seem to play off each other. It is just as fantastic as it was then, and I think I know why now. In preparing for this video, I found a mini documentary about the making of Moral Oral, where we get to see a lot of things behind the scenes. One thing I noticed in the documentary was that the actors didn't record their lines in a sound booth individually. They seemed to be sitting around a table, each with microphones speaking their lines together in real time. Now, Moral Oral isn't the only show to do this, but it is a fantastic way to add a hidden layer of realism to the dialogue. Actors speaking their lines into a void, even if they're very talented, just isn't the same as having a conversation with the other person right in front of you. Just a cool little tidbit that I haven't seen discussed elsewhere. Rather than explaining anything to Oral about the new baby, Clay decides to send the boy away to his grandfather, Clay's father, while Bloberta is pregnant. Oh boy! What's a grandpa? This is the same guy that told Clay he wasn't worth it back in his childhood. But Grandpa takes an immediate liking to Oral, showing him true kindness, and actually spending time paying attention to Oral, way more than Clay ever did. And finally, we get to the main crux of the episode, Oral's boundless trust in others. I'm a thousand damn feet tall. Wow! Whoa. Oh. So, you believe me just like that? Sure, why wouldn't I? There is not a single deceitful bone in Oral's body, and so he wholeheartedly believes that everybody else is the same. This is why he believed his friends even when they told him that falling off the electrical tower wouldn't hurt him, even as he was crying from the pain. The show even directly tells us this in the song Suspicious and Cool by Mark Rivers, the series composer. Well, why not trust? So what's a fool? When you've only got one rule, let's do avoid suspicious and cool. Apparently, this song was written by Dino Stana BTS specifically for the show, so it isn't available to download anywhere that I could find, so great song, but what the fuck, Dino? On the other side of this is Grandpa Arthur. He tries to make Oral understand that people aren't always so forthright as he is. Sometimes they do this thing called lying. Like when I said Stephanie is secretly a furry. That was a lie. She's actually a closet Insane Clown Posse fan. But even in convincing Oral of that truth, Arthur has to resort to manipulating the boy's trust. You remember how I said chickens were made? Yeah, nature. That's right! And that makes you not stupid. Yay! But, but Again, this is exactly the sort of topic that the planned season four would have covered, except with Oral being more of a basic scene kid, listening to Bullet For My Valentine, and Grandpa living in the Puppington house with him. It seems like the main purpose of this episode was to hit many of those plot points in a condensed format, wrapping up the intended story. Grandpa introduces the concept of proof to Oral, which fits with his skeptical agnostic character. He is also, ironically enough, the person that first introduces Oral to the concept of God, mainly due to Clay's cowardice and or laziness. But regardless, Oral takes the lesson to heart. 
He begins questioning everything that people in authority try to tell him, no longer relying on their better natures to always tell the truth. There's this scene where Miss Censordall contacts Clay to inquire about Oral's Christianity, and I wanted to highlight it here not because of anything about the story part of it, but because it's an example of the vastly improved visual quality of this episode. It's not just the increased fidelity moving to HD, everything has been improved. Look at the lighting in this scene, how it really feels like cold moonlight filtering through the windows, how the shadows from the fire dance around the room. The composition of this frame is just fantastic, and that's no disrespect to the original series, because in the behind the scenes video, it's clear that they put in a lot of work to the sets. We wanted this to have a very ominous feel, something where Oral walked into kind of this large, ominous, dark room, lots of taxidermy, hunting items, guns, alcohol, of course, uh, we have the liquor cabinet. But this is just a step up from that. As Oral is waiting for Clay to come pick him up, he shares a really touching moment with Arthur. It's the only time that we really see a full hug between Oral and any of his family that I can recall. They had a truer relationship in that short time that they knew each other than any of the other Puppingtons had. Although, at the same time, we know that Grandpa had a hand in making the household as fucked up as it was. Had he not neglected and abused Clay as a child, recall he blamed Clay for killing his mother, then likely Clay would have been a more well-adjusted adult, and probably wouldn't have been so easily manipulated by Bilberta, meaning Oral straight up wouldn't exist, so if Grandpa had been nice to Clay, then we wouldn't have a show? Why did I go down this logic path? Regardless, Oral gets in the car with his father, and they speed away to the hospital with Bloberta in the back, already going into labor. The joke here is that Clay went out of his way to pick up his son, rather than take his very pregnant wife to the hospital immediately. All three of them go into the delivery room, where Clay tries to finally explain to Oral where babies come from, unsuccessfully. Just the prospect of his father having any sort of conversation with him, explaining anything at all, causes Oral to nearly faint. I think I need to tell you something. You do? Jerk. Dad, finally. <laughs> he has been so neglected by his father throughout his entire life, and it only becomes clearer with every interaction. Meanwhile, Dr. Potter's Wheel steps out mid-birth to avoid the conversation, leaving Bloberta to silently deliver Shapey herself. At the moment of their second child's birth, Clay comes up with an explanation. Rather than telling his son anything about sexuality or biology, or even a fanciful explanation involving storks, he immediately defaults to God. And all we need to do is make him happy. Always. But if we can't see him, how can there be proof that he's there? Proof? Now where did you hear- Grandpa! Of course, Clay doesn't know this yet, but any explanation involving God usually sets Oral down some strange convoluted path that usually results in necromancy or crack smoking or something way out of left field. This is where all that starts. It all stems from his father not being truthful with him, avoiding any legitimate discussion with his son. And it's not going to take long for that poison seed to sprout and grow fruit. We next see them in a church in what is apparently Oral's first time going. It's an impromptu mass called for by Clay to fully indoctrinate Oral. We know that Clay and Bloberta were once avid churchgoers when they were younger, so this implies that they just stopped at some point. It also implies that their piety, hey, look, I pronounced it right this time, the piety that they display in later seasons is even more hypocritical than we previously knew. Once again, the entire reason that they're here is because of Clay's explanation in the delivery room and Oral's reaction to it. Reverend Putty's sermon is all about doubting God, or rather, why we shouldn't. I'll tell you, there's no better way to be God-proof than to demand proof of that guy. See how I turned that around? <laughs> <laughs> But innocent little Oral, basically operating on a level of pure word association, asks if God is a lie. Also, do you think he just lazily lies? Lies. Lies are things that aren't real. Lies around and does nothing all day? What if God is a lie? <gasps> Which sets off the reverend and causes the angry Christian dommy mommy herself, Miss Censordahl, to intervene. Putty and Censordahl try to scare Oral straight, using the idea of hell. Hell is a horribly hot and homoerotic place where bad little boys go who question God. Homoerotic? It works. Sort of. 
While Clay tells Oral to swear off his grandpa, Oral still decides to write to him, let him know that he won't be able to visit or talk again. Despite listening to Clay trying to honor his father, he still loves his grandfather. Arthur was the first and only person to show him true love and kindness, showing us that the true way to teach somebody a better way is to first love them and listen to them. But of course, Oral takes Miss Censordahl's words literally, as he is wont to do. She talks about how Abraham proved himself to God by killing his firstborn son. So, wanting to do the same, Oral hatches a plan. Where are you taking your baby, sissy? Ha! Insisted. Oral, I'm gonna kill him! For God! Ha <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we're talking! <laughs> he and his friends take the baby to the church and create a sacrificial altar, preparing to kill the baby. But they are stopped right before Oral can follow through with it. It isn't Bloberta or Clay or even Reverend Putty that stop Oral from killing Shapey. It's Grandpa Arthur, wielding a cross like a glorious goddamn pole vaulter. Clay was busy drinking his troubles away as usual, and Bloberta, well, I don't know, it doesn't say where she was. Once again, Arthur is the only person that cares enough about Oral to pay attention to him. Grandpa, God stopped me! What? Through you! Outside the church, we see a short interaction between Clay and Arthur, ostensibly their first of such since Clay moved out. Though that's just speculation on my part. Clay has one of his rare moments of vulnerability. I didn't have the confidence to answer any of his questions, let alone talk about God, because I felt worthless. But Grandpa is either still holding on to that seed of anger over Clay's mother, or he just doesn't know how to respond, because he has an opportunity to make things right, to try making up for the guilt that he has forced on Clay as a boy, and perhaps turn it all around. But he stays silent, and Clay sees that, and immediately switches back on his defenses. But now I know that's the answer to every one of his questions! We know that Clay isn't a good father. He isn't really a good man and he has done and will do some pretty awful, cowardly things. But he wasn't born that way. Nobody is born bad. He suffered throughout his entire life, making him a very defensive, insular person. And while he's an adult and responsible for his own actions, a lot of the trauma that got him to that point can be placed at the feet of Arthur. When Oral finally comes out of the church, Clay tells Arthur that he's not to see his grandson ever again. And there is this pretty short, yet terribly heartbreaking scene that follows. Oral is so desperate for positive attention from his father that he scorns his grandpa, the only person that truly cared for him, just to get that attention. And we know that Oral isn't just obliviously obeying Clay either. He's not just parroting words. We know it because of this. <clears throat> just that little wink. Oral knows deep down that his grandpa did nothing but love him, and so he isn't comfortable completely being mean to Arthur, cutting him out entirely. He's only doing it because Clay is giving him positive attention finally. The episode ends with a callback, the first time that Clay ever calls Oral to his study. But it doesn't have quite the impact we would imagine. Oh boy, I get to go in your study! Yippee! As the music plays out, there's this narration by Grandpa Arthur, confirming what we said at the beginning of the video, that Oral is far too trusting and will believe whatever people tell him to. However, he is at the same time too pure of heart to truly be corrupted. And ultimately, Grandpa was right. We see this being tested time and time again throughout the original series, Oral coming in contact with a corrupting influence, but ultimately coming out unscathed, if not literally, at least morally. He is basically the only character in the show that keeps his faith unconditionally through the end, believing that while people may be hypocritical, his faith is pure. Pay attention to this point, because anyone that commented about the show being atheist propaganda or just an anti-Christian screed, well, you kind of missed the point of the entire show. It's unfortunate that we never got to see how the actual series would have played out. But Before Oral is a decent substitute in my eyes. While it occasionally runs into the pitfall of over-explaining things when it's not needed, it's mostly just outright clever. Many aspects of the special are at or above the main show. It serves as a good send-off to the series. Even though we don't get more details on what happens after the show, the context that Before Oral provides really wrap things up in a nice bow. 
And that, folks, is all of Moral Oral. Now this little video series is wrapped up in a nice bow, from me to you. I hope you enjoyed it. I plan on doing more videos like these two, going in depth on other cartoon series. So if you like these videos, maybe consider joining my Patreon to help me make more of them. My patrons make videos like these possible. Also, please consider doing all the other things, liking, subscribing, hitting the bell so you don't miss notifications, and promising me your firstborn child in a blood pact. Either way, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.